so if you're on the online class, you can be guaranteed that your uh, test scores will be uh, put online by Friday. But hopefully for the on-campus class, um, I'll be able to return your test uh, on Wednesday. So that would be nice. Um, that being said, let's get started from where we ended up last time. So the last thing we were talking about was Vesper theory. And uh, we were talking about essentially three different molecules. Let's see if I still have them built here. Methane, ammonia, and water. kind of squeeze down. 
Okay, so that's what's happening in the structures of those various molecules. Okay, so let's move on. So we finished that. Let's uh, consider um, another type of molecule, a uh, linear molecule. So notice uh, the difference between, uh, well, let's build CO2 first and then we can talk about it. So let's build carbon dioxide. Okay, so um, we recall to build molecules, we gotta build them from using their Lewis structures first, right? So we gotta ask ourselves, well, which is going to be the central, and um, which is gonna be the outer atom? How do we figure out which is gonna be the central? Do we have to build them now? Okay, well, you can look at it that way, but the, the rule is that the <coughs> least electronegative atom is going to be in the central, in the center. Okay, so carbon, if you remember, and you'll always have a table of electronegativity values, just like you have a periodic table that's given to you on the test, okay? So from now on, you'll be able to look at the table of electronegativities and ask yourself, well, which one's more electronegative, uh, oxygen or carbon? And when you do that, you'll figure out that carbon is less electronegative, so it's going to be in the middle. So uh, we'll write the central atom first. Then we write the Lewis stock structure. Remember, for carbon, it's one, two, three, four, like that. And then we have the two oxygens. Well, where do they go relative to the carbon? Of course, on the outside. And they're exactly the same, so you don't have to say, well, one oxygen, oxygen one has to go here, or oxygen two has to go here. You can put them either way. So oxygen and oxygen. And then what we find is oxygen, of course, has uh, six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, like that. And then the other oxygen also has six valence electrons, like that. And if we look, carbon needs four uh, more valence electrons to fully uh, fill its outer uh, valence shell and oxygen needs two. So, of course, they're going to combine in a fashion that we're already familiar with, making uh, two pairs of double bonds between them. Okay, notice the two uh, pairs of arrows here, the two pairs of arrows here, indicating that we're making two double bonds. And if we look, we still got one, two, three, four valence electrons around each of the oxygens. So we'll put the like that. So hopefully everybody's able to build carbon dioxide. Um, let's look at the structure of carbon dioxide. And we can compare it to those. that we have passing around right now. Okay. 
to the H's. In carbon dioxide, we actually can say we only have two bonds, two double bonds, okay? Even though those double bonds are composed of four electrons each, okay? So a double bond you can think of as two single bonds that are kind of overlapping with each other, just kind of like what this structure is depicting here, okay? So if you don't mind, just so I can. So if you can see, right, kind of the two double bonds overlapping with each other. Okay. So remember here we have these electrons trying to get as far apart from each other as possible on this sphere of um, a carbon atom, right? So remember a carbon atom is a spherical thing. So those electrons are trying to get as far apart from each other as possible. So they can do that by uh, going to 109 and a half degrees. But with the double bond, since we only got two bonds here, the furthest they can get apart from each other is a total of 180 degrees, okay? So that's what that structure is showing there, right? So um, on a sphere, the furthest away you can get from each other is to be on opposite sides, right? Just kind of like uh, the poles on the earth or something like that. So this angle is going to be due to the fact that these electrons don't like each other, so they want to get as far apart from each other as possible. So you're going to have a 180 degree angle there, and this is known as a linear molecule. So this is going to be the most common way a linear molecule is formed. When you've got these two bonds on opposite sides of the, of the molecule. How do you determine the difference between a strong and a thin structure and a linear structure? So that's what I was just talking about. So if you look here, right, with the bent, the bent structure, you got the four electrons, okay, so right? Yeah, so the, the electrons are like kind of trying to get as far away from each other as possible. So when we're looking at the, the linear structure here, we've only got these two bonds, right? Or these two areas of electron density, if you want to think about it that way. It might make more sense, right? So since you got only two areas of electron density here and here, right? They're trying to get as far away from each other as possible. But when you got to look at this, or this, or this, right, we've got these four areas of electron density that are trying to get away from each other as far as possible, okay? So, like I was saying, usually you'll find that when you got these kind of two double bonds uh, around the central atom, it's going to be a linear molecule. If you've got two single bonds with the lone pairs, it's going to be a bent molecule, okay? So you really want to think of things as they're uh, if you will, electronic structure or this regions of electron density and it'll really help you out, okay? Um, let's look at one more type of molecule. Um, this one is going to be a, a trigonal planar molecule. <coughs> trigonal because you see that it's got three bonds, okay? Three bonds. And planar because all the atoms are in the same plane, okay? So trigonal planar. Notice one of those three three bonds is a double bond, okay? This molecule here is called formaldehyde. Um, I'll keep it for a second. So remember, this is a tetrahedral. This is um, trigonal pyramidal.
there's a um, Lewis structure of formaldehyde and I show me the structural formula, you would have to decide, well, what's the central atom first? So hopefully you would decide that it was carbon, right? Because the other thing you want to know is that carbon makes the most bonds, okay? Anything in group 4 or 4A can make up to four bonds out of all the nonmetals. So usually what you'll find is that carbon is almost always the central atom. Okay, when you got that as an option. Um, of course, hydrogens can only make one bond, so you know they're around the perimeter. Um, oxygen, of course, has to be bonded to that carbon. So let's just go ahead and put the carbon in first. Uh, draw the Lewis structure of carbon. One, two, three, four. Um, then we'll put the oxygen. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's right. Then we got an H with one dot and an H with another dot. <laughs> so you can imagine that you could try to bond this in a number of ways. Maybe the H is to the O, uh, H is to the C, O to the C, um, so on and so forth. But what you'll find, and then I, I suggest that you try to do it that way, but what you'll find is that there's only one way to bond these atoms together. And we'll just go over that. You can go over on the other on your own. Um, of course, the carbon's going to bond to the oxygen. So notice we've got a single bond being formed between that carbon and that hydrogen, single bond being formed between that carbon and that hydrogen, and two single bonds being formed between that carbon and that oxygen, so that would be considered a double bond. So let's draw the Lewis structure of that, of what we just drew. Like that. So that's the Lewis structure. Notice the Lewis structure and the structural formula are going to be different. Why is that? Because if you think about that, uh, in, like what we were talking about earlier in terms of elect areas of electron density, we notice around this carbon atom here, we've got one, two, three areas of electron density, right? So in order to get as far away from each other as possible, they're going to be in a 120 degree angle. Okay, who's got, oh, I still got it. Okay, so notice that's a 120 de degree angle that they're at, right? So this is 120 degrees. The furthest you can be away from each other on a sphere if you've got three um, spokes or whatever, if you will, three bonds is 120 degrees, okay? Um, where are the other ones that are out there? Do you have all of them? Okay, so pass them around again. Now you can look at all of them together, okay? So this is linear. you're going to write the Lewis structure. Um, I don't know. This is enough.
another way of determining it. It's not really uh, the way that I taught you, but if you can read over this, and if it uh, makes more sense to you to do it that way, you can do it this way. I think, honestly, drawing the fluid structures of the particular atoms first and then putting the arrows together really is the easiest way to do it. Yeah? This is trigonal planar. Oh, yeah. I'd like you to remember. Um, plus trigonal planar. Okay, so I don't think trigonal planar is listed on this uh, this slide. Here. So make sure you put something that's trigonal planar in there. Okay. This has four, four, four. This is really a good way to remember it. So let's erase this and put that trigonal planar up there and compare them this way. So you know 
this, you can't just say this is a bent structure, right? Because you can see kind of part of it's bent there. So you can see the tetrahedral is there, a little bit of the tetrahedral. So for those of you who are watching at home, right? Tetrahedral part, bent part, um, more tetrahedral stuff, kind of a trigonal pyramidal, okay? So there's, uh, there's a bigger and bigger type molecule you get. The more and more variation you're going to have um, at different particular centers. Okay, so let's build a molecule that's instead of just has one central atom, let's build a molecule that has three central atoms. Okay, and that's the molecule that's being shown on the slides right now. Can I erase all of this stuff here? Hopefully, say no.
sign that fully first, right? Everybody hopefully can agree with me. Notice the similarity between that central oxygen, right? Okay. Just have removed these hydrogens and put what we call these methyls instead. Okay? So the central oxygen there is banned. If we look at the carbon here, hopefully you would say, well, that carbon's got four regions of electron density around it, or four electron groups. None of them are lone pairs, so the ideal bond angle would be 109.5. Okay? So that's the bond angle there, 109.5 degrees. And uh, if you were to guess what the molecular geometry around that central atom was, hopefully you would say tetrahedral, right? Because, of course, you want to get the problem. So, tetra means, is that mean? Tetra means four. four. Yeah, so tetra means sure four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so like uh, a common name for four legged creatures is like tetrapods, like horses and dogs. You know? Well, now you know. Pod means foot, you know. Okay. So, um, if we're to analyze in more detail this structure, notice we've got three areas of structural um, uh, identification to do. Okay. Right? So we would say, well, around this central atom here, this first carbon, we've got a tetrahedral uh, structure, right, with the bond angles being the ideal bond angle of 109.5 degrees. Then if we move to the central oxygen here, well, since it's got the two lone pairs and two bonds, well, we know that's 104.5 degrees because those lone pairs are squishing it down a little bit making this a bent structure. And then we come over to this sec second carbon and ask ourselves, well, what's the molecular structure around that? Well, since it's got four bonds, it's also got to be 109 and a half degrees, okay, which is the tetrahedral structure, okay? So hopefully, I wouldn't be, at, so some, some, of course, uh, molecules that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it's very, hard to figure out, well, this has to be uh, combined in this particular fashion, okay? So once you get bigger and bigger molecules, you can actually start combining them in different ways that the molecular formula doesn't give you enough information to show which way the atoms are actually attached to each other. So this angle here? Would be 109.5. 109.5. What's that, that angle? 109.5. 109.5. <laughs> 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 this one, 
bond can be polar, right, if the electronegativity is different between the two atoms that uh, are in the bond, okay, um, what you'll find is the electronegativity, of course, of hydrogen and oxygen are quite different, okay, uh, I think hydrogens is 2.4 and oxygens is 3.1, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but it's something like that, or oxygen 3.5. But oxygen is very, very electronegative. Hydrogen is not very electronegative at all. So what you find is that when you look here, you've got a delta minus up there and a delta plus there and a delta plus there. Okay? So this molecule is a polar molecule. Okay? It's due to the fact that it's like this little magnet that's got these oppositely charged regions of it. Okay? So if it were to act, interact with another molecule okay, of water, in fact, it would interact in such a way that would make these two molecules orient their positive and negative uh, ends in such a way that they would want to be where there's a delta positive, the delta negative wants to be, delta positive, delta negative. And in fact, the way that they would actually orient themselves is that these lone pair of electrons would be kind of associating with that uh, electron uh, poor hydrogen. Remember, this these bond, these electrons here are being shared, but not equally, right? So more electron density is here than there is here. So that hydrogen kind of wants to have a little more electron density. So what it'll do is since these lone pairs are so, these bunny ears, huge things, right? They'll kind of associate themselves close to them, okay? And in fact, if you looked at the crystal structure of ice, it would look very similar to this with the, uh, Another another H. So this is what ice looks like. Okay. With the uh, of course this is delta minus, delta plus, delta minus, delta plus. Uh, interaction, interaction, interaction. These interactions here, specifically when you've got hydrogen interacting with the three most electronegative elements, N, O, and F, okay, when hydrogen interacts. Of course, this is not a bond, right? It's an interaction, because a bond is when you actually have them stuck together, okay, these are in different molecules, so it's not a bond, it's an interaction, but unfortunately, it's named incorrectly, it's called a hydrogen bond, okay, so this thing, this interaction is called a hydrogen bond, and it occurs when the very uh, electron poor hydrogen that's attached to one of these three atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, is kind of interacting with another one of these three atoms, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, you get this kind of, what we say, a partial kind of connection, okay? And this is known as a hydrogen bond. So it's, uh, if you will, a misnomer. It's misnamed as a bond. But it's because they came up with this name before they really understood the whole concept of bonding. Okay? So. Oh, there is one thing I w wanted to show you. Um, the polarity of the molecules. Some demonstration. I'll have to wait until Wednesday to do it, but it's pretty interesting. Um, I'll have to remember. It really is cool. Okay? So, remember... <coughs> Let's go back over what we just talked about. Electronegativity. The most electronegative elements are found in the upper right corner of the periodic table. The least electronegative are in the lower left. 
Look at the electronegativity between difference between hydrogen and oxygen, 2.1 to 3.5. So 2.1 here, 3.5 here. So that means that you're going to have more <coughs> negative charge uh, associated with the oxygen. Excuse me, and then the hydrogen. Okay, so if we look at HF here, this is a polar covalent bond. We call it a polar covalent bond because, of course, it's a covalent bond sharing of the two electrons. It's polar because the electronegativity difference of the two atoms that are sharing those electrons is, um, there is a difference, okay? Um, so, again, when you have a polar covalent bond, what happens is the molecule acts like a little magnet, uh, giving one part of the uh, molecule a uh, delta minus and the other part a delta plus. We can represent that in a couple of ways, like we've been representing it up here with the delta minus and the delta plus, like that. Or we could represent it with this arrow here. This arrow indicates the same thing as delta minus and delta plus, but it makes it a lot easier to draw than delta, 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 right? So um, when you draw the arrow, of course, arrow means negative charge in chemistry, okay? Remember, electron arrows are like that, okay? So when you draw the arrow, you put a little positive sign on one end of it and put the arrow going towards the negative side, okay? So in water, it would be like this, right? So that would show the polarity of the two bonds, okay? Notice that the little cross shows the positive side of the bond. That's the less, ele less electronegative atom, and the arrow goes towards the more electronegative. Um, you can look at this on your own. It's the same stuff we've been talking about. Okay, and then you can ask yourself, which would be more polar? How do I determine that? Well, I look at the table of electronegativity. HF is, or F is 4, CL is 3, H, of course, is 2.1. So the polarity of the HF bond is more than the polarity of the HCl bond. Um, you can see the polarity in uh, water here, okay? Um, this is a different sort of depiction of it. Blue uh, indicating positive charge, red indicating negative charge. Um, yeah, the center of the partial positive charge is midway between those two atoms there. Um, Notice here you've got uh, a molecule that has two uh, polar covalent bonds, okay, but they're opposite of each other, exactly opposite of each other, and they're the exact same magnitude since they're between carbon and oxygen, both of them. So what they do is cancel each other out, okay? So this actually, even though it's got two polar covalent bonds, is a nonpolar molecule. So it's a nonpolar molecule, even though it's got two polar covalent bonds. Okay, and then you can see here, so polar covalent bond, nonpolar bond is zero uh, change of electronegativity, of course. Polar covalent is all the way up to 2.1. That's the HF um, bond, and or a little bit more than that. And then after 2.1, you go to ionic, okay, then you get straight up electron transfer because the electronegativity is so great, the difference, that one just rips it off the other one and doesn't share it anymore, okay? Um, yeah, we could talk about more intermolecular forces next time. Uh, the one thing I want to say is that you should be expecting a quiz sometime soon. Um, probably we'll do it uh, either Friday or Monday, okay? So Friday or Monday, I'll tell you more about it uh, on Wednesday, okay? What was that? So it'll cover everything to what we talked about before the quiz. So if, it, if it's on Friday, then it'll be everything that we cover up till Wednesday. So it'll probably be up till chapter four is what it'll be. Chapter
chapter 4, if we can do a little bit of chapter 5, then it'll be that. So I'm saying, let's start from chapter 